Welcome back to another episode of Meet Cute, where we explore the stories of extraordinary people with radical meat-based beliefs. I'm your host, Alex Rhodes. In today's episode of Meet Cute, we have Kimberly Pearson. She is Carnivore Kimberly on Instagram. In this episode, we discussed how Kimberly overcame her sugar addiction, how she has improved insulin sensitivity, and what she has learned through her journey to find health. If you struggle with food addiction, diabetes, motivation, or are at all pregnant, I would definitely recommend this episode for you. Today we have Kimberly Pearson on, and we are so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, This is going to be awesome. I have a feeling <laughs> we're off to a good start. So yeah, yeah. thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to, to meet you in the AT. Mm-hmm. That's right. And, uh, I'm looking forward to diving deep. Yeah, me too. Me too. All right. So we will start with, I mean, this question, I guess. So tell me a little bit about your parents and their dietary restrictions or habits when you were growing up and how they affected how you viewed food. Okay. So my parents both grew up in very small towns in Texas and my dad, I've I've always kind of joked. I'm the, the child of my father's old age. He was 50 when he had me and I'm 36 now. So you can do the math. He's 86 years old. He was born in 1936. He comes from a family that did not have two pennies to rub together. And he has always told me that when he was growing up, the thing that kept him alive was cornbread, grease, (laughs) like dipping cornbread in grease. And they had a Jersey cow that he would milk, stain the cream off the top and he would make chocolate milk. And so that fat and carb was basically what kept him alive. They also ate a bunch of salt pork. Uh, very, very poor family. My mother grew up uh, in a, a little bit more normal home. She was born in 1949. So she kind of missed coming out of the Great Depression. Um, but her family cooked just good old fashioned comfort country food. Lots of mashed potatoes, lots of fried okra, Um, lots of pork. So I, I come from both sides that ate a lot of pork. Um, my dad remembers that his mom loved to bake and so did my maternal grandmother. And so I come from a family whose relationship with sugar brought on in my maternal grandfather, my mom's father, type two diabetes And my father also has type two diabetes and his father had type one. So my paternal great grandfather had type one that set me up for a really interesting relationship with food uh, because my mother, to her credit, would always cook, generally speaking, home cooked meals. And it was greens and fried okra. And sometimes we would do chicken fried steak. I mean, she would go out of her way to cook what she considered to be healthy home cooked meals. And that was, that was a okay for me until I got to about the end of high school and going through high school, I realized that I was never quite as lean as the other girls. I would, um, I was an athlete in high school and college And I always had this like roll around my middle that I never could seem to get off no matter how much I ran or how much I lifted or or what I did, um, that the other girls just didn't seem to have. And I never could figure that out. And I, I developed as a way of coping with kind of uncomfortable emotions, binge eating. And because of the the type two and type one diabetes that runs in my family, I developed an extremely unhealthy relationship with sugar and I became essentially a sugar addict. Like I remember 
when I was, I don't know, in high school going into college, I would pour myself a bowl of Cheerios, hold the Cheerios down, pour milk in, and then take the sugar bowl and just pour sugar all over the top. I mean, I, I don't even know. I don't, I wouldn't measure in tea, taste tablespoons. I would measure in like quarter cups of sugar that I was putting into my Cheerios. And I would just sit there at night too. <sighs> Looking back on this, I'm like, who was I? Like, how did I, you know? Um, and, and I would just eat the whole bowl. And then at the very bottom, my favorite thing was to drink the sugar milk. And over time, insulin resistance set in, I started to gain a whole bunch of weight, you know, and then, but it, my parents' relationship with food was definitely, I remember a couple times hearing, you know, take a few more bites and then you can get up from the table. So that was, that was something, um, I was never expected to clear my plate necessarily. Um, but my dad would just get, you know, a heaping pile of food and just shovel into his mouth. My mom eats like a bird. Um, and then my father had a heart attack, August, 2019. And so that was kind of a wake up call to him because then his doctor somehow recommended either the keto diet or the Mediterranean diet. I had just gotten my board certification for health coaching, specializing in low carb diets. And so because the doctor gave him no other information, he called me and he's like, can you please help me? figure out how to do this low carb thing. And I had already been doing it for 10 years and I was like, yeah, sure. So I went over and he actually came off of his metformin. And so that was kind of a big deal for him. Um, the doctor of course wanted him to continue his statin, which, you know, we all have our opinions on statins and cholesterol, but, um, I, I get where the doctors are coming from. Oh, and on that note, none of this should be construed as medical advice. <laughs> I just have to put that disclaimer out there and I forgot to do it in the beginning, but I just want to put that out there. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, that's, that's kind of how I started just loving sugar and, and doing everything that I could. Like if I'm eating sugar, I'm planning how I'm going to get sugar in the future. Like it was just all encompassing. It was an addiction. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So we, so kind of going back to these high school days, this was sort of your compensation. So the sugar addiction developed out of the you know, emotional safety of food from mm -hmm. this root issue of being overweight or having this role. Mm -hmm. Do you consider, would you have considered yourself extremely overweight or just like generally overweight? Not at all. Not at all. Um, I was a size eight in jeans. Um, and to be fair, I am 5'11". And so I have always just been like a, like a bigger well, like I'm, I'm, I'm a large to extra large woman. I've come to terms with the fact that I will never wear a size small medium in shirts or dresses or anything like that. And that's just something that I have had to become okay with because of my size. You know, there's nothing that I can do about the size of my skeleton. So, um, but the, the coping really came in because in high school, and the fact that I can remember the weight that I graduated at in high school should, you know, tell you something about how obsessed I was with it. I graduated high school at 172 pounds, which sounds heavy, but I looked good in my clothes. Like I was not overweight. You couldn't really tell that I had a, a role. And whenever I say a role, it was just, I mean, if you want to call it baby fat, maybe baby fat, but I was not skinny by any stretch of the imagination. And I kind of settled into the mindset that my body just wants to look like this. And I'm always going to have this little role. What was the realization like for you when you figured out like, okay, number one, I wasn't ever really overweight. And like, maybe was that a societal thing or, you know, just this like expectation of body image that you had? What was the realization like going and looking back and being like, wow, that was it. And like, that was, I was normal, but then it led into this sugar addiction that led into another plethora of things. When I was in college 
And I went to play volleyball for a division one school in Texas. And at the end of my freshman year, I sustained basically a career ending knee injury. And I tore my patella tendon. So like your quad and your kneecap, it just kind of went, that was fun. Um, and because I had been so extraordinarily active in, in that sense, I was able to outwork a bad diet. Um, but then as soon as I became sedentary, cause I didn't want to have surgery, I did not want to have super invasive knee surgery at 19 years old. And so they were like, well, you know, you can kind of let it go if you want to and see what happens. And so now I have scar tissue in my knee and all that stuff, but I'm, I'm still glad that I chose that. So I became really sedentary and my eating habits did not change. In fact, they got worse because now I'm out of the house. And so I can go to McDonald's and Taco Bell two or three times a day if I want to. And I can order literally anything that, that I want to, and I can eat as much as I want to, to try and fill that hole inside, you know, that you're, that you're trying to fill. And I don't even know how to describe it. It's just, there's a, there's a void that's just like a vacuum for whatever it is. And for some people it's drugs, for some people it's alcohol, for some people it's food, for some people it's exercise. You know, it's like you, you can do too much of anything. Mm -hmm. So I got up to about 260 ish pounds. I was a size 18 going into a size 20. And that's when it started to kind of sink in that, you know, I've, I've heard people say before, gosh, I wish I was as skinny as when I thought I was fat back then. And I remember my, my last meal as what I call a fat kid. I went to McDonald's and I got a Big Mac, a quarter pounder with cheese, supersized fries for both meals, a large chocolate shake and a diet Coke because I'm watching calories. You know, you don't want to be crazy with it. And I ate and drank every bite. And I remember sitting in the middle of my dorm room bed because my roommate had moved out. So I literally had no one to, to judge me or ask me what I'm doing or ask me if I'm okay. Uh, and I remember sitting in the middle of just this, this McDonald's like carnage that was spread all around the bed. And I was like, if I keep going like this, I will die. I will kill myself. Cause I knew enough that McDonald's is not <laughs> the healthiest option, especially whenever you're doing it like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I have to make a change. And so it was then that I started looking into how can I lose weight? And of course, the first thing you do is you start counting calories. That was the realization for me was sitting in my bed with the McDonald's just wrappers and boxes and everything. And I was like, I can't, I can't keep doing this to myself. Oh, it's the moment when you comes first, you mm -hmm. know, you finally realize like you did this to you and the only person that can fix it is you, Yeah, you know, which is like, to me, one of the most mind blowing parts of anybody's journey. It's humbling for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. No one forced me to do that. You know, I, it was a thousand percent willing and, if I hadn't had that moment, I guess I'd still be doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you had PCOS, am I correct? And we're on metformin at some point. Yes. Yes. Okay. For off, Well, I was, I was just going to say on the metformin, it, it's an off-label uh, fertility treatment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's kind of complicated, my PCOS story, but we'll, <laughs> we'll untangle it. Okay. Is that now that was that a little bit later in life? The diagnosis came earlier this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I did not. Okay. Yeah. I did not realize. Okay. Okay. Well then we're not there yet. Let's backtrack back <laughs> to you had this sudden realization and the next step you thought was maybe calorie counting. How did mm -hmm. you, how did you approach that? And how did it feel, you know, searching for an alternative? Did it feel overwhelming? There's a lot of information out there that I, I feel like people approach it with 
there with the best intention, you know, um, and, and at that time that was about 2006 ish. Um, I, I thought according to conventional wisdom that in order to lose weight, it's calories in calories out. And so I started, I, I went the complete opposite way because I, I've never had until I started carnivore really a healthy relationship with food. And so I started starving myself and I was like, well, if it's just calories in and calories out, the less calories in the more weight you're going to lose. Like logically that would make sense, but in practice, that's not how it works. And I did lose initially like 20 pounds, but you can't sustain a starvation diet. And so then as soon as I started eating again, no matter what it was, even if it was like salad and grilled chicken, I would gain the weight back. And I started to, and I, I kind of lapsed back into that mindset of, I guess this is just what my body wants to weigh. And I had no idea where to go from there. Um, but fortunately we have access to the internet <laughs> even back in the early two thousands. And I started, you know, Googling how to lose weight and everything. And so then I stumbled onto the Atkins diet and the South beach diet. And my mom even took me in to get blood work because she was convinced that my thyroid was out of whack. Well, of course everything came back normal. So allegedly my thyroid was fine. You know, looking back, they do the uh, the THS, the thyroid simulating hormone in your T3. Well, that doesn't tell the whole story of your thyroid, but that's a conversation <laughs> for another time. Um, <clears throat> but blood work came back normal. The doctor ironically told me, he's like, you know, you, you like to eat fast food, don't you? And I was like, well, yeah, you know, it's fast and easy and it's designed to taste good. And he's like, well, whenever you go, for example, to Whataburger, cause I'm a diehard Texan and we love our Whataburger. He's like, get whatever you're going to eat, but get it on the wheat bun because wheat's complex carbs and it burns slower. And I'm going, okay, yeah, I can do that. So I switched to the wheat bun, literally no change. Surprise. Shocked. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but golly, I can't, I can't even begin to tell you the number of diets that I have tried everything from running myself to death on the treadmill to my mom, helped me do Jenny Craig. I tried Weight Watchers. I, it, and it's for me personally, it was unsustainable. I know that yeah. people do have success with it. I just personally, it was not for me. Yeah. Can I, I would love to ask, you know, through, I mean, look, your story is very eerily similar to mine, which is creepy because mm -hmm. I'm also <laughs> about six foot and, you know, yeah. my top weight was like 270. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm curious after, well, first I want to point out the resilience. I mean, you know, you're here now, you know, on a podcast talking about radical health, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, taking and putting yourself back in these positions where you're trying all of these, you know, Jenny Craig, Atkins, you know, you name it, you tried it and just failing and failing and failing. What kept you going? What kept me going? That's a really good question. I, I guess I was tired of being uncomfortable. I was, I was tired of hurting all the time. I was tired of, feeling bad after every meal that I ate. And it, it started to become a question of why can these other people have success on these things? And it, it fails for me every time. And I, I just knew in my heart that I hadn't found what worked for me yet. And I just, kept going. And fortunately I did have the support of my mom because she was very concerned, <laughs> you know, as, as any, I think parent would be looking at your child who is obese, quite frankly. And even because I'm so tall, like you, I carried it well, but I was metabolically unhealthy. Like I, for some reason was never tested for insulin resistance or diabetes or anything like that. Uh, but I 
was absolutely at the very least insulin resistant and on my way to being diabetic. I mean, I, I know that I was because I was having blood sugar crashes if I didn't eat 17 times a day. Um, and anyone who's been in that, in that situation knows how bad you feel and that's not normal. It may be common, but it's not normal. And so I was just exhausted with what I felt was like my body betraying me because I was doing everything right, but it wasn't working. And so there was a mystery there that I, I had to solve. <laughs> awesome. So you just couldn't put it down. You were like, I have to figure it I out. I couldn't. I, I knew what I, like, I knew just from, from like a purely societal standpoint, I knew what I looked like in high school. And I felt like I should still be able to at least move back towards that. Because to be fair, I was not eating an insane amount of fast food back then. You know, I was eating what my mom was cooking. So there was a, there was a disconnect between what I was eating in high school and what I was eating as an adult. And I, I started to realize that there was a relationship there between the weight that I had gained, the way that I felt and the food that I was eating. And so that's where I kind of started to go with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. So, I mean, eventually this led you to the carnivore space. It did. There was one stop in between all the failures and carnivore. And that was Mark's daily apple with the primal blueprint. And my friend, bless her heart, Megan McAuliffe, shout out to Megan. She was into CrossFit and she was also eating primal at that time. And so she came, she was a friend of mine from high school. We kind of lost touch, but she came back into my life when I graduated from college and she saw my struggles with the eating. Like, you know, I would talk to her about it and she's like, Hey, why don't you just go check out marksdailyapple.com, read some of the articles. It's all free information. There's nothing to buy and see if that makes sense to you. And also got started in CrossFit at that time. Love CrossFit. <laughs> and I went to Mark's blog and I started reading about why grains are bad for you and why sugar is bad for you. And it like light bulb moment. And overnight I went from like fast food binge eating to steak and sweet potatoes and green beans and grilled chicken and like a primal whole food diet. Um, I still ate cheese. That was the only thing that saved me on the, on the transition. And I started legitimately losing weight. And I went from like 240 to 215 to 180 and then 180, 185 is kind of where I bottomed out. And then I at least had gotten to that point and I was like, this is awesome. You know, I feel like I could still lose, you know, 15 to 20 pounds, but if I don't, I'm happy. And I didn't feel bad after I ate anymore. I, I did notice some like, I started to develop acne, like right along my jawline, which is hormonal. And I still had eczema, which would come and go from the time that I was a child. And those little nagging things never really went away. The acne kind of got worse and worse. And I was still going by uh, Mark Sisson's 80-20 rule, where 80% of the time you eat the way that you're supposed to eat 20% of the time. Life's too short. Have the piece of birthday cake at the birthday party, you know? And then let's see, I was, so between 2010 and November, 2018, I was dyed in the world primal. I loved it so much. I, I preached about it to people because it was a way to break away from the standard American diet, which is, making and keeping everybody sick. And I got certified 
I was like one of the first ones to come through his level one primal coach program. And so I became a primal coach and then coached some people with success. And then in November, 2018, like the day before Thanksgiving, I stumbled upon an article by Kevin Stock called The Dangers of a Plant-Based Diet. And I started reading through and I was still having a little bit of bloating after eating. My eczema wasn't going away. My acne was getting worse. And I, I started reading about the anti-nutrients in plants. And a lot of that started to make sense. And I was like, you know what? I'll give this a try because I can always add vegetables and fruit back into my diet. Eating meat for 30 days is not going to kill me as far as I know. <laughs> so I kind of embarked on this grand experiment and then 30 days turned into 60 days, turned into 90 days and life just kept getting better and better, quite frankly. And it wasn't until, and I mean, you can go back and look at my Instagram because I was, I, I was transparent about what I was eating. I was probably 97% strict carnivore. If I wanted a piece of cake, I was going to have a piece of cake and I knew it was going to make me feel awful, but you know, you embrace it. Life's too short sometimes. Um, but it wasn't until I got pregnant in August of this year that, well, this will be 2023 by the time it airs. So last year, <laughs> August, 2022, I got pregnant and I experienced meat aversions and literally walking through the grocery store, the sight of beef would just turn me off. Like I, I have never experienced anything like that. It's beyond loss of appetite. It's really intense, really intense. And that's not something that I expected. But How was the transition between being a strict carnivore, like having that meat aversion, and then you added fruit back in? Am I correct? To yes. Your diet? Yes. Uh -huh. Fruit was like, I wanted cold, sweet, and, and it was really the cold and the sweet. So I didn't want anything that was cooked. I, and, and fruit pretty much scratched that itch for me. I wanted yogurt. I wanted cold cheese. I like live on string cheese. <laughs> now I was afraid in the beginning of being attacked for eating what my body would allow me to eat because I, I felt on some level that people had come to expect a certain style of eating, which is fair. You know, my name on, on Instagram is carnivore Kimberly. I mean, that's kind of become like my online persona with my little gray steaks that everyone loves to hate. But when I lost my appetite for that, I really struggled with coming out, if you will, uh, with the fact that I had been in my mind forced to add plant food back to my diet and I ended up reaching out to carnivore yogi, uh, Sarah Kleiner. And mm -hmm. she told me that during her pregnancy, she had been extremely transparent about eating potatoes and tomatoes because they're very high in B6. And so that was just what she craved. And when she came out with it, you know, you, you kind of have to be unapologetic in in the online space. If you do something that works for you, it doesn't matter if someone from Timbuktu agrees with it. It's your life. You're not trying to live up to the standards of someone else. And so I came out and I made a big post about, you know, the, the plants that I had been eating and the meat aversions, which I was not expecting prior to getting pregnant. I was like, Oh, no big deal. You know, women and their cravings, whenever they get pregnant, it's, you know, you can, you can power through it if you really want to, you know, it's all willpower. It's all what a, I was, wrong. I was <laughs> so wrong. Um, I mean, once I got pregnant, if you put meat in front of me, my stomach would turn like, and, and it was just my body signal that for whatever reason, meat was not what my body wanted then. Mm -hmm. And I became a strawberry addict. 
I had to have strawberries and apples and blueberries. And I'm grateful for that because rather than caving and craving like what people would consider bad carbs, I mean, no one's going to get mad at a pregnant woman for eating fruit. That's just, you know, <laughs> I mean, maybe outside of the cardboard. Community, yes. But, um, but I, I felt like on some level I needed permission from like another carnivore who had come before me and had experienced all of this to be honest and say, Hey, you know, carnivore right now is not working for me. I have to do something else for my health and wellness and the unfollow buttons up there. If you don't like it, exit stage left. If you want to hang out, here we go. So I love that. Truly. I mean, you touched on something there that, I mean, I really didn't expect processing through the emotions of just having this fan base or this crowd base that expects you to eat a certain way. And for you, you know, to even feel bad, you know, yeah. for your own body, you know, and, and personally, and this is maybe this is my opinion and less a question, but it's like, you know, any man out there has never experienced pe pregnancy and never will. You know, I'm a female who's never experienced pregnancy. So how am I going to tell you, oh yeah, you can fight the cravings or even if yeah. I was a woman and I had been pregnant and I was able to fight the cravings, mm -hmm. how, how is that even applicable to you considering yeah. we're two completely different women, you know, yeah. and I, something in this space that I have grown to understand is that, you know, people have these harsh boundaries within this world. And this is, I mean, this is a great question for you. Like, how do you feel about those harsh boundaries now that you've gone through this prominent transition in your life where you're like, okay, I have meat aversion. I literally want to puke if I look at meat, you know? So how has that changed your view about carnivore and about like people who explore in the lifestyle and in this like meat based realm. I started really to soften on the dogma of carnivore, even prior to getting pregnant, um, getting pregnant and holding on to any dogma. I mean, you know, we make plans and God laughs and that's just, that's the way of it. Um, but when I took the level two primal coaching certification, we went through a, the, the whole thing is based on something called motivational interviewing, where the conventional coaching model is, I tell you what to do. And if you don't follow it, you're a bad client, you fail. Whereas the motivational interviewing coaching, you meet someone where they are, and you work with them to co-create solutions to help them meet their goals. And so you just make the person realize that they already have the tools that they need to get done, whatever it is that they want to get done. And you facilitate and kind of hold their hand and well, what obstacles are you facing this week? And so then they, it, it's you, you want your client to talk more than you talk as a coach. All you do is ask questions and that really softened me and gave me a different perspective as opposed to coming at someone and being like, well, if, if you think carnivore is not working for you, then you're not doing it right. And you need to, you have to cut out plants from your diet and you can't eat fruit and you can't do this. If it works for you, do it. <laughs> you know, if, if you want to do heavy meat base and have a little fruit on the side, who am I? Like each person is an expert on themselves. And if at the end of the day, carnivore is not it. I mean, don't, don't force yourself to feel bad to try and meet some irrational expectation that you have, that you're a failure. If you can't do this, like it's strict carnivore is not for everybody. And to even hear those words come out of my mouth. Cause I used to be dogmatic. I used to be just, you know, if, if you're not eating protein and fat from an animal, why are you even eating? And 
while I still feel that way for myself, because I always felt the best whenever I was pretty strict carnivore, that may not be the case for someone else. And so it's just a matter of experimenting and finding what works for you and doing that. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. I think that's one of the things people don't even realize is this is just an experiment. You know, everything we do on a daily basis is an experiment. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. does this make me feel good? Does this make me feel bad? Um, and whatever works, works. And mm-hmm. it is different for everyone. And that's why, you know, some people come in my inbox and maybe this is just a personal uh, thing to say. And they're like, oh, do you recommend I do this? Do you recommend I do that? And Every I'm day. like, look, I do this. It yeah. works for me. If you want to use that as a starting point for mm-hmm. your exploration, go for it. But I promise you what works for me may not work for you. Yeah. It's like, do you feel that you should try that? And then they're like, well, I don't know. My doctor said such as a, well, is that a concern for you? Well, yeah, you know, I'm kind of concerned about the cholesterol. It's like, okay, tell me what you know about cholesterol. Well, you know, I don't really know too much about cholesterol. And so then you can get into this education rather than, well, you're stupid because you haven't, you know, researched or, you know, whatever, but that's, (laughs) I I learned a lot. I learned a lot in that level two coaching. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And I also think people take, like people underestimate their ability to inherently know, you know, like I, I don't have to know anything about cholesterol to know that I feel better when my cholesterol is high. Yes. You know, I don't have to know how fluffy it is or, you know, (laughs) Whatever, the, you know, because I really, you know, even after all of these years and even being in the health and fitness space, if you were to tell me about cholesterol, I would learn at least 10 new things. I'm sure, <laughs> you know, same. same. I mean, I'm, I'm no expert mm-hmm. at all. Perpetual yeah. student right here. Absolutely. But I think that's what makes experts experts is because they are perpetual students. Somebody mm-hmm. asks, you're going to go look it up. Yes. hundred percent. Every time. Every mm-hmm. time. Yes. I love that. So how did you know that you wanted to coach? And do you think it has something to do with like all of your overcomings? Like, did you want to share that with others? In the beginning, I got the level one really for me. I wanted to expand my knowledge of the body and the way that, according to that course, the way that the primal way of eating would affect people. Uh, it was interesting because even in the level one, they talked about keto kind of before keto was really big. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get certified to start coaching. I did it to expand and grow myself. And then when the level two came out with that, that once you completed the level two certification, you were then qualified to sit your board examination. And I was like, you know what? I could get that and then start working with doctors and accepting referrals to number one, help people like my father who have either just had a heart attack or are on their way to having a heart attack and help those people reverse that because 10,000% you can reverse type two diabetes with diet lifestyle alone. And really no doctor wants to tell you that because they, you know, and this gets into the whole conspiracy behind big pharma. It's, it's either easier or it's more lucrative to just write your prescription for metformin or whatever. And if, if there was one person that I could help get off the cycle of carbohydrate addiction, I wanted to at least try and so that's, that's really what motivated me to want to step into this space and start helping people with it. I love that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That was a simple question, simple answer. Yeah. But can you tell us what PCOS is and like how it's played a part in your life? Yes. So PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. It is where on the ovaries around the time of ovulation, your ovary forms a cyst. And this happens for every woman, whether you have PCOS or not. Um, But the difference is for a woman with PCOS, the cyst does not rupture 
and release an egg. Whereas in a woman without P- PCOS, the cyst ruptures, heals, and then the egg is released and travels down the fallopian tube to hopefully get fertilized if that's what you want. Um, but the problem with PCOS is that every month you develop a cyst that doesn't rupture. And so depending on the severity of your, your personal journey with PCOS, you can develop ovaries that are just taken over with cysts. It is, as I understand it, extremely painful. Um, it causes some degree of, of infertility and irregular periods and is usually associated with insulin resistance. They don't, I've, I've read both that say that PCOS causes insulin resistance. And I've also read that insulin resistance causes PCOS. So I can't, I can't speak to what came first, you know, kind of the chicken or the egg sort of thing, but they are intimately related. And I went my entire young womanhood without knowing that I had it. And then when I met and married my husband, we got pregnant very quickly. And that was kind of shocking because I had been married before for eight years and I was never able to get pregnant. And I, I think that when I went primal and started to lose the weight and reverse my insulin resistance, that I put my PCOS, because there's no, as far as anyone knows, there's no cure for PCOS. I've, I've read some stuff that says that you can cure it with like, I think it's berberine and inositol. I may not be saying those correctly, <laughs> um, but there's some combination of like herbal remedy that, that you can, that you can do. Again, this is not medical advice. Um, but I had not run into that yet. And so I kind of had what, what I dubbed silent PCOS. I never had painful periods. I never had irregular menstrual cycles. It was all just, I mean, it was like clockwork. And the only thing that I can attribute to that was my diet and how strict I was doing both primal with minimizing the sugar and then into carnivore. But I still was not able to get pregnant. And then went through a pretty intense divorce in 2000, uh, in 2021 and then met and married my husband in 2022. And then almost immediately we got pregnant. I mean like within the first two months and that one ended in a miscarriage, just a, a natural chemical miscarriage then about two months later, we got pregnant again. That one was an ectopic. And I was working with a fertility specialist at that time um, that had kind of walked me through everything during my first experience with trying to get pregnant. And when I came to her and I said, hey, I had a miscarriage and then an ectopic, she looked straight at me dead in the eye. And she was like, based on your something that she pulled in my blood work uh, that had to do with my my egg quantity and my age with the miscarriage and the ectopic, she's like, I am 99% sure that you have PCOS. And there's, there's not a test to like determine whether or not you have PCOS. And so I, I kind of pushed back a little bit and I was like, but I've never had any PCOS symptoms. And she's like, well, you can be asymptomatic and still have PCOS. And that kind of threw me for a loop because that is not at all what I was expecting to hear, but all of the symptoms that I was having lined up with PCOS. And she said, okay, so here's what we're going to do. I had to go through an extremely painful treatment, um, two injection injections of methotrexate to treat the ectopic pregnancy, uh, which was just devastating. I was like, are you sure? Are you sure that there's nothing? Cause you know, I had waited 36 years to get pregnant. And now here I am and it's pregnant and it's just 
loss after loss in like the absolute worst way. And she's like, there's, there's nothing that we can do. I mean, if you, if you refuse this treatment, it's going to rupture and you're probably going to lose one of your fallopian tubes in your ovary. So, uh, you, you play it however you want to, but this is what's going to happen. And so we opted for the treatment and then she put me on metformin once, once the treatment was done and I was kind of back to normal. Um, she was like, so here's, what's going to happen next. I'm going to put you on metformin and you're going to take one baby aspirin every day. So the 81 milligram baby aspirin, uh, there's some evidence that baby aspirin reduces the rate of miscarriage from like 80% down to like 20% or so. I mean, it's, it's, incredible. But I've also read that baby aspirin causes miscarriage. So I don't know, again, none of this is medical advice. (laughs) Um, and surely enough, two months later, we got pregnant and I don't know if it was the metformin. I don't know if it was the baby aspirin. I don't know if it was just God's timing. Um, but this one took, and we are five months pregnant, just found out that it's a girl and we're very excited. (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so, so exciting. I mean, got to yeah. take a second. Congratulations. Thank you. It's been a heck of a journey. I can't imagine. I can, well, I can't actually, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure that it has. And I'm, you know, happy that you guys are finally, you know, reaping the rewards to your, you know, mm-hmm. dedication and hard work, honestly, that I'm sure has gone mm-hmm. to in emotionally and physically into the pregnancy. So really congratulations. Mm-hmm. So you did mention something that I'm, that I'm, you know, curious about, and it is a question, um, that I have on here for you that we kind of skipped over during our story, but it's, uh, you know, how did you come, how did religion come into your life and, you know, what does it mean to you? Religion. I don't know so much that it's religion Mm -hmm. as, as a connection to what I believe is the, the living revealed creator of everything, reaching out, desiring a relationship with every single one of us. Mm -hmm. And there came a moment because I was raised Baptist and I, I strayed hard from the path. I like dabbled in witchcraft and finally sort of settled into like some strange, like Buddhist pagan, like nature is God. And I can see that and I can believe in that, but there, there was always something out there that I was like, but it had to come from somewhere, you know, like you can't just have order out of chaos that doesn't happen that way. Chaos just, just continues to kind of spiral out of control. Um, and then I, I I can't even remember really the exact moment of there was like a triggering thing, but I remember just one day waking up and suddenly it's like my eyes were open to everything. And I mean, literally everything in this world is a battle between good and evil down to like our own way that we live. And, you know, if you eat sugar, not that that's bad necessarily, but it goes towards the sin of gluttony if you can't control it or the, the wars that are going on where he said, she said, and I'm right. And this is my country. No, this is not, it's my country. And it, it just, you know, on a, everything from like a macro to a micro level, it's a battle between good and evil. And that for some reason was just like, Oh, well, of course, you know, it's, it's God and Satan. (laughs) You know, we, we, we live in a world where Satan has dominion and he prowls around like a lion devouring who he may. And it just hit me one day. And I was like, I can no longer deny that, that scripture is true. And, Jesus died for my sins on the cross. And from that moment, I became a disciple of Christ and have walked that ever since then. It's it's everything. It's like the foundation of everything. That's beautiful. Beautifully said. 
Beautifully said. Well, I'm, you know, I'm happy that you are able to channel that foundation and that, you know, that was, that, that was just such a big thing that clicked for you. Very good. Very good. Okay. So I think the last question is, you know, something that I really want to start driving home on this platform is like, you know, in spite of everything that we have talked about today, you know, from PCOS to disordered eating, to sugar addiction, to all of these things that you've overcome, failure constantly, you know, Mm -hmm. in every way, physically, mentally, spiritually, you know, how empowered do you feel now being you? Because there are some days where I wake up, I'm like, I don't got this, (laughs) you know, uh, just, just the raw reality of it is, there are some days where I, I question myself am am I doing the right thing? Am I failing somehow? Am I working hard enough? Am I doing enough? Am I still growing as a person? Have I somehow stagnated? Um, and then it, you kind of have to, even on bad days, remember that the sun will rise And that even if you didn't accomplish everything that you wanted to do that day, tomorrow's a new day. And whatever it is that you were going through that maybe made you feel like that or made me feel like that, because I I go through that, Mm -hmm. um, you, you just have to kind of put on your big girl pants and realize that maybe not everything works out exactly the way that you want it to, but for me and from where I'm sitting, I know that God has my best interest at heart and he made promises to me that he will always help me. And I know that if nothing else, when my own power falls short, I can rely on that. And so it it really doesn't matter how I'm feeling personally because, you know, Satan whispers in your ear all the time, tells you that you're not enough and you don't do enough and you are a failure, but you're not. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's the perfect, it's the perfect (laughs) way to end it. (laughs) Oh, well, I so enjoyed all of these conversations that we had today and our synonymous background for sure. We're like the same person. (laughs) Yes. Very similar. Very similar. So yes, but I loved having you on the show and thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, oh, one, one more thing. Even though I have added carbs back into my diet during pregnancy, I have not experienced radical weight gain, which I thought was kind of strange because as soon as I, in the past, if I ate anything or, you know, kind of went off track for a week, I would gain a lot of weight, Mm -hmm. uh, which would come off pretty easily as soon as I got back on, on carnivore. But this go around, I have gained what my doctor considers to be an appropriate amount of weight for me being pregnant. So do you, do you think that, (laughs) no, that's great. Do you think that that has something to do with, um, just maybe like fixing insulin resistance through carnivore, you know, like I being I void of the sugar. That, mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. That I have, if, if not a hundred percent fixed my insulin resistance, that I have become far more insulin sensitive. Um, but even, even then when you're pregnant, you go into a state of insulin resistance, but so far, whenever I've done like the, the urinalysis at my doctor, I'm going to actually have another one done today at one thirty. whenever I go in for another ultrasound. Um, I don't pass glucose in my urine. My fasting glucose, the last time I checked on December 10th was 77. And so I, I mean, maybe someone out there has, has the answer to that, but I don't know. Just wanted to throw that out there that there's no. something that seems to be kind of protective about pregnancy whenever it's come to that. I did have a little bloating in the beginning, um, but that's kind of gone away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like, you know, growing a child inside of you, we may have a couple of things where we're like, oh yeah, that's yeah, <laughs> not quite normal. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, common or normal. Yeah. Than not common. I don't know. It's, mm-hmm. it's, been, it's been fun. Thank you for listening until we meet again.